Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, to West End. Thank you for being here, and uh, hope that you'll join with us in our in our class tonight. Our um, our topic in this class is First and Second Peter, and we are uh, nearing the end. We have tonight, and we have um, the last Wednesday of August will be our, our last two classes. Next week will be the gospel meeting here with uh, Andy Cantrell. So. Uh, goal tonight is finish up chapter one and um, get as much of chapter two in as possible. The goal is to get it all, but if not, uh, that Joey can decide whether he wants to chew on that a little bit or just focus on chapter three. But um, goal tonight is finish chapter one and two. So I hope that you'll join in with that, follow along with that, and um, participate in that. Um, I messed up, didn't realize what time it was, didn't ask anybody to lead a prayer. So if you would bow and I'll lead us in a prayer as we begin. <clears throat> Lord God, Father in heaven, we're so thankful, Lord, for a beautiful day, for another uh, opportunity at the close of the day to come together um, with other Christians and to study your word. We pray, Lord, that our hearts and minds are in the right place every time that we're here, Lord, but uh, especially now as we uh, continue the study of First and Second Peter, and we pray that our, um, our Bibles will be open, our minds will be open, we'll, we'll look to your word for um, guidance, <clears throat> we, we will make application from what we learn, and uh, and, and truly uh, look for ways that we can improve our lives based on the, the words that have been preserved for us. We're thankful for your word and for um, the impact that it can have in our lives if we will spend our time studying it, and uh, we pray that you'll help us with that tonight. We pray, Lord, for those that uh, cannot be with us, those that are, that are struggling with, with issues. We pray specifically for um, Debbie Lanphier and David as he cares for her. We are uh, mindful of the struggles that they are going through, and we pray that you will uh, help them and comfort them. We are thankful, Lord, for all of the, the blessings that we have through you, and uh, especially the forgiveness of sins that we can have through your Son, and the uh, hope of heaven that we have through that. It's in uh, Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so I, I just tacked on my slides of chapter 2 onto the end of chapter 1 since we didn't get done with chapter 1, so I'm just going to breeze through the first couple real quick, and then I'm going to speed through everything we already talked about uh, through chapter 1. But just remember, again, the idea of knowledge comes up a lot in, uh, in Second Peter. Specifically here in chapter 1, we see it five times uh, in the first eight verses. Um, the idea of know or knowing or knowledge comes up 16 times here uh, in this, this short letter. So very important, uh, all the chapters kind of uh, end with some, some idea, some version of knowledge or knowing certain things. Uh, we see the, the idea of no, uh, the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, multiple times throughout the letter, so that's important as we go through this, um, kind of a, one of the underlying themes as we go through it. We talked about glory all throughout First Peter and Second Peter. Um, it's five times here in Second in Peter, and we talked about that some, some last time, but specifically uh, the ideas of knowledge and glory kind of book in this, this letter from, from verse uh, 2 all the way to um, verses 2 and 3 all the way to the last verse of the letter. We see those ideas of, of glory and knowledge. And so we try to keep those things in mind as we, we talk about these things. And then quickly, we just kind of did a, an overview of the letter. Um, First Peter, we talked about most of this last week. You received all that you need. Verse 3, we know very well. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him. There's knowledge who called us by his own glory and goodness. So we talked about that idea of uh, having everything we need and what some of the applications that we can make from that. We talked about the idea of always needing to grow, even though um, w we have all that we need, there's still things that we can learn. Uh, adding uh, to our Christ-like qualities, we talked about those things. So those verses that you know very well, verses uh, 5, 6, and 7, uh, uh, adding to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and those sorts of things, self-control and um, those things that you're very familiar with, uh, endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, and love, uh, just to round out that list. So we talked about those things, and we talked about the idea of, the, of being nearsighted and blind if we lose sight of who Jesus is and what it means to have been redeemed by him, to have been rescued by him, or cleansed through him. If we lose sight of that, then, then we've really lost sight of all of it. And, and the, the, the imagery here is that we are nearsighted or blind. No matter what else we do, whether we claim to have these qualities of, of goodness or knowledge or brotherly affection or whatever, if we, again, just like uh, 1 Corinthians 13 says, you know, we become that resounding gong if we don't have the right attitude with all of that. And that comes through love in 1 Corinthians 13. And we kind of see that same idea here in, in, first, or in 2 Peter chapter 1. All right, I'm going to jump on, uh, actually, I'm going to jump back. Um, 
And then the last thing that we didn't really get to talk about, which is where we're going to start tonight, is that idea of trust us. We were there. We were, we were eyewitnesses to it. We've got the prophets and prophecy. Uh, never came about by man's interpretation. So those things are going to be important as we round out chapter 1 and then slide into chapter 2 and, and, and talk about these, these false teachers that, that were and are and are to come, basically, is the idea that Peter gives us there. All right. So then, kind of 30,000 foot view again of chapter 2, we touched on this um, last week, uh, but again, the idea, there were false prophets then, there are going to be false prophets now, or false teachers now, and um, some will be led astray by that, we'll talk about that a little bit, he talks about God rescuing the righteous and punishing the wicked, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail tonight, he uses imagery there of, uh, uh, he talks about angels, talks about Noah, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot. And makes, draws those parallels um, so that we can kind of understand some things um, and hopefully uh, make some application from that as we go. Uh, he'll rescue you from your trials. Um, and the, the, the end of false teachers is not a, not a pretty picture. They can't deliver on what they promise. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then kind of the, the end of chapter 2 is one of those tough sections of Scripture that uh, hopefully we'll have some time to talk about. Um, the end would be better if they had never known Jesus than if they knew Jesus and turned their back on him. We'll hopefully spend some time on that. And then that kind of leads into chapter 3, which uh, Joey will be on deck for. But the idea of remembering the words of the prophets and the apostles. And the, the scoffers are going to come and they're going to they're make fun of you and ridicule. Where, where is this, this Lord that you said was coming back? Where is this judgment? Where are those things? Uh, and then we talked about the idea of time and, and how we should live in, in relation to that. And not misunderstanding the Lord's patience, the idea of uh, rounding that out again with the idea of growing in grace and knowledge and the glory being uh, to him. So that was kind of, again, fast, high-level overview. Any questions, comments on that? We talked about it last week. I'm not going to spend tons of time there today. All right. So just wanted that fresh in our minds kind of as we begin. So now let me fast forward because we talked about most of that. So let's pick up in verse 12 of 2 Peter chapter 1, and then that's where we'll uh, kind of begin our, our more in-depth discussion. Let's read through the end of the chapter. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, we'll read verses 12 through uh, 21. Actually, I lied. Let's just read 12 through 15. That's what my slides are set up for. Second uh, Peter t uh, 1, 12 through 15. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth. Uh, that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. All right, so real quick, I'm going to go, there's, we could, we could go down the rabbit trail here of what's going to happen to Peter, right, and how does he know that, and, and what does uh, tradition say having Peter. I don't think that's the best use of our time tonight, but Peter's saying his, his time is short, uh, and whatever, whatever he knows at this point, whatever he uh, understands, he knows that his time is short. And so he makes the, the, the effort here again to, to, to remind them. That idea comes up a couple times in these passages. I think it's good to remind you. It's that important. I want you to remember these things after my departure. So he's, again, this is, this is early in the letter. It's, you know, 12 verses in. There's a reason for this. He's going he's gonna to call this his second letter a little bit later in, in the letter. Um, but we, we just see the idea of Peter knowing that, it, that, it is, that his time is short and it is important for these things to be on our mind. So he's not going back and rehashing everything that he did in 1 Peter, uh, but we see the thoughts kind of uh, align a little bit with 1 Peter. Again, we see glory come up quite a bit. We see trials and suffering come up a little bit. We don't see so much of the submission or subjection that we talked about a lot in first Peter but we see a lot of those ideas kind of kind of come into play together but we just see Peter here with a plea to them to understand that these things are that important comments questions on that I wasn't gonna say a lot about it do you, do you feel the urgency with which Peter is is kinda saying this I hope so I, I think that's I think that's the, the, the main point there that he could spend his time talking about a lot of things. His time is, is short, and he's not even going to go into as many of the things that he talked about in, in 1 Peter. But I guess this is, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't call this like a deathbed kind of a thing. But, but if Peter, you know, if you only had one thing or one more opportunity to kind of address some people before your time was going to end, what would you spend it talking about? This is what Peter chose. So let's try to keep that in mind 
as, uh, as we talk through um, the rest of this. Anything else? Good? All right, let's roll. All right, so verses 16 through 21, we will read. Um, <clears throat> 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what do we see in the, the remaining verses here of First? or 2 Peter, and I get that wrong every time, 2 Peter chapter 1. What do we see in these remaining verses? He says, We didn't follow cleverly devised or contrived myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do you think Peter is bringing up the idea of following myths? In the context of 2 Peter... What were they likely hearing or seeing? Okay. The Greek and Roman gods. Yeah, that, that, in that time period, they would have known that very well, right? I, I don't do very well with it. I'm not much on that stuff, I guess. I, I, know, I know Thor and maybe Zeus and, and a couple others. But, uh, but they would have known that very well, right? That was in their face, that, that Roman culture, that Greek culture. And, uh, and so what comes along with those things? Great big stories, right? I don't want you not want to call them fairy tales, but great big elaborate stories that 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 do what? What do those stories try to do? Okay, they try to they try to make sense of things, right? They try to explain things, whether that be creation, whether that be the origin of man, whether that be uh, the powers of nature or or whatever, and so everything kind of falls in line with some some big big story, right? And there's different versions of them. There's, there's different ways to, to interpret them and apply them. And what's the end result of all of them? All right, made up, right? <laughs> Fake. Uh, they, they don't really solve anything. They don't really explain anything. There's holes in them, right? So no matter what... Um, no matter which one you pick, uh, you, can, you can usually find a way to shoot a hole in it and, and it doesn't hold water, as opposed to what Peter is talking about. And how does Peter prove what he's talking about? Or what is, what is Peter's evidence? I'm sorry, go ahead, Ella. I didn't see your hand. Absolutely. That, that's his plea, right? I was there. We saw it. We, we heard it happen. This, we're not, we're, this is not anything that's made up. This is not anything. And, and so many you know, other applications we can make with this kind of outside of, of, of Peter's original audience there. Um, there are lots of myths out there, right? And there are a lot of people that would accuse the Bible of being a myth, right? Would accuse it of being made up, would accuse it of being having holes in it or, or having inconsistencies in it. And we know that's not true. We know that, that, that this, was put, this was not put together by two or three people in a very short period. It was over hundreds of years. By, and I forget the authors, how many? 40-something authors? You guys with your Bible facts can help me out there. Um, we know that this was, this was put together over um, hundreds of years, thousands of years. And, um, and the story has the same, as Eric, as Eric has talked about, it has the same flow from beginning to end. It has the same meaning, the same message, and everything kind of flows together in that way. Peter says, we were there. We saw it. We heard it. We were eyewitnesses to it. Um, 
And then what's his, what's his next argument? If, if you don't believe us, what else do you have? You got scripture, right? You got prophecy. Uh, he's going to talk about that later in chapter 3. What verse is it? Verse, um, verse 2 of chapter 3. He talks about you recalling the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the command of our Lord and Savior given through your apostles. So he talks about that written word that we have. We have prophecy. And he's gonna, that's going to come into play a little bit later in the chapter, but, but prophecy is something they would have been very familiar with. He, he calls to memory in 1 Peter and 2 Peter things that they would have known about, prophecies that were written down and then that they would have been able to understand and then make application of uh, moving forward, right? And then he makes this, this other uh, statement that is very important. Um, Above all, you know this, verse 20, no prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation, but... Because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We're not going to get into the whole Holy Spirit class. Eric's got that covered very well on Sunday mornings. But we see an example here of what the Holy Spirit does. Part of what the Holy Spirit, Spirit's role is. And he's talked about that some already. The prophecy never came from, from man. I mean, what does... Um, never mind. I'm not, I'm not going to derail myself there with something that I didn't have planned to say. Go ahead. And also, this prophecy, like anything else that we're talking about, is it's a perfect fit for the season. We're in the fourth century. It, is, it has perfect meaning. And it has perfect meaning. It's not just a story. Or it's just saying a story, you know, of entertainment. This has a purpose for itself. It has the power of giving knowledge. Absolutely, yeah. Good point. Uh, definitely has a deeper meaning than, than just a story, for sure. Anything else? Uh, yeah. Back to the Holy Spirit. Uh, faith by hearing. I understand the Hebrew, and it's somehow been corrupted. He was on the Hebrew. It's just tied upside down. What do you think about the Lord saying? Do you, do you know the scripture about that? Uh, I forget the exact reference. Um, I, I didn't write it in my notes. But, yeah, he told him. Somebody help me out if you know it right off the top of your head. Um uh, the Lord never told him he was going to be crucified upside down. I do know that. Yeah, that's that's tradition. Uh, yeah, I, we talked about that. I think in the intro to First Peter, that's tradition holds that. Yeah, he was crucified upside down because he didn't want to be. He didn't feel worthy to be crucified the same way Jesus was. That's the traditional story. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, but that's that's the um, the general consensus there. Uh, Uh, yeah, so it's John chapter 21, verse um, 18, where, where Jesus is talking to Peter. Uh, this is a verse that a lot of people go to, to 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 explain this. But it says, truly, I tell you, when you were younger, this is after uh, the whole feed my sheep, feed my lambs thing. Um, he says, uh, I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. So that's one of the verses that comes up, you know, your hands, somebody else will stretch out your hands. So that's that's one of the verses they go to, to to talk about possibly that being his crucifixion. Don't know. Yeah, Matt.
Yeah, great point. Way to, good, good way to tie that all together. Yeah, so they were, they were there. They both kind of fighting those same battles. John talks about false teachers and false prophets quite a bit, the Antichrist uh, in 1 John, and then Peter's talking about it here. So, yeah, very, very similar language. Good. Anything else? All right. Uh, let's see. With 20 minutes to go, I probably ought to get to the chapter I'm supposed to be talking about. All right. Uh, all right, so let's jump in. I'm going to skip over that. All right, 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, let's, let's dive in real quick, and let's see what we can accomplish. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, beginning. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even when, or even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. All right, let's jump. All right, where are these false teachers going to be? I changed my format on this, you may notice. I put most of these in forms of questions and get you guys. What's that? Going to be in the crowd, right? And sometimes I think we, we blow, right through, blow right through that when we talk about false, false teachers or false prophets. Where are they coming from? Well, in this verse, it talks about um, among you. Um, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that parallel is definitely there. As we talk about, you know, what they would have known as he, he calls to mind the false prophets. There were indeed false prophets among the people. To, to your point, L.R., of, of, of Moses and, and those, uh, just as there will be false teachers among you. So it's, it, we got to be careful, right? There's lots of uh, things we need to be watching for, lots of uh, applications there, but we're not going to have time to talk, say everything there is to say about it. Uh, what might those false teachers claim? What, what, what do you think Peter's warning them, warning them about? We haven't talked about it a lot. More of it comes up later in chapter 2 and 3, but based on your knowledge of Second Peter, what, what are the... What are the false teachers, uh, what's their M.O.? Okay, yeah, we'll talk about that some more when we get a little further down. What is, what is Peter specifically going to address? Some of the same things Paul addressed, to give you because he ends, if you notice, at the end of chapter 3, he kind of calls Paul into it. And says, you know, Paul talked about some of this stuff too. Yeah, John. I don't think it's what they're getting to. I'm pretty sure many of the followers of Second Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not what I was going for, but that is a great point that you bring up because that is, that's one of the, that, that's, I, I guess, one of the more troubling things here, right? Yeah. What's that? I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, exactly. I saw Amy, and then I'll come back to that. Yep. Okay. Yeah, they're denying Christ. It says, you know, the, the denying the master who bought them. And then to Matt's point, they're, they're denying the coming of the Lord. Remember, Paul talked about, he spent a whole chapter uh, talking about the resurrection is a real thing, right? It's going to happen, and they're saying that it's not going to. Um, and then in chapter 3, we see, the, the, again, the idea of where is this coming? Where is he? You know, he said he's coming. Where is he at? It's been... It's been a minute, and I don't see this, 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 this event that you're talking about. Um, and, and what else goes along with that? If there is no second coming, then there is no what? Resurrection. No resurrection, no resurrection, then there is no what? If we're not all raised to go do something, what are we not going to go do? No heaven, and then if there's no heaven, there is no... No hell, right? There's no judgment, right? And I think that's the, that's one of the huge false teachings that we see. We see it here. We see it in in our day and time today. That once you start that argument that 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 the Lord's not coming back. Well, if the Lord's not coming back, then there's not going to be judgment, right? And if there's not going to be judgment, then there's not going to be punishment. There's there's no heaven. There's no reward. There's no punishment. So then, what's the natural progression? And we see it depicted here in chapter two. What happens if you start to believe that stuff? 
who said you said that yeah downward spiral right it's just a you're there's it's going to be a steady decline from any sense of, of of morality any sense of reason to to obey anything what does obedience mean what's the point if there's no judgment if there's no resurrection if there's no heaven there's no hell there's no punishment there's no reward then who cares what are we doing why are we here yeah You have, uh, yeah, you hit on a good thing. I'm going to leave that alone. But, yeah, um, it is definitely here today. That's, that's the end result of that. And, and that's what I want to get to with this, right? It's so, so let's see, what is the natural progression if you believe? All right, so what might the false teachers claim today based on your experience? We talked about what they were talking about then in the first century. What does that look like now? No moral standard. Okay. If, if it feels good, do it, right? Yeah, Amy. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly. That's in my notes. Uh, that's one of the. That's one of the things we might see today. Jesus. You can't deny that he was here. There's too much evidence, right? Uh, you can't deny that he was something more than than normal. But there's too much evidence of that too. But. People will say, well, he wasn't God, he wasn't equal with God, or he was a God, but he wasn't the God. He was, he was a prophet, he was like Elijah or Isaiah or whatever. He was a good dude, but he was, uh, he was not the Messiah, he's not the Savior, he's not going to come back and all those sorts of things. Again, once you go down that path, where do you stop? And, and it just gets worse and worse. Yeah, anything else? No, go ahead. Exactly. Yeah, and that's the other end of that, that same spectrum that ends in the exact same place, right? God is there. God is real. God created us. But God is love. God's not going to punish us. How could God? God is so good. How could God punish his creation? So if God is good, God loves us, God's not going to punish us, then we should all just eat, drink, and be merry, right? Go ahead, Joey. Yeah, that's definitely the, I mean, that's the one of our day, right, of our, of our time, is, is the, the whole inclusivity, the inclusion. It's nothing's wrong. You can't tell anybody they're wrong. It's, you know, how could you? Because, I mean, if I've seen this post once, I've seen it a thousand times, and it's something always to the effect of, you know, you know Jesus would have been sitting at the table with all of those people, so how dare you say that, that it's wrong? Jesus would have... Well, yeah, Jesus might have been sitting there with him, but he wouldn't have just told him it was okay. You know, that's completely misunderstanding the scripture. And so let's get off that soapbox and move on. But yeah, it, it's from within. It's dangerous. There, and, and, it, and, and it's going to be things that, I mean, they may not come out as, as blatant as denying Christ right off the bat, but it may start in other things. Like, what does salvation look like? What is required for salvation or, or things like that? And, and once you start muddying the water on some of those things, you start to see other things kind of fall off and it, and it, it starts to spiral again. All right, uh, let's see, natural progression, we talked about that. Okay, how will these people behave? Depraved? Yeah, depraved, degenerate, right? Um, 
Yeah, they will exploit you, uh, verse 3 says in the NIV, or not NIV, that's CSB. Uh, they will exploit you, uh, ESV says the same. Um, and then their condemnation from long ago is not idle. So I just answered my own question. But what does Peter offer in the way of comfort of this? Don't feel like they're going to get away with it, right? Their condemnation of long ago, pronounced long ago, is not idle, and their destruction does not sleep. That kind of reminds us of chapter 3 a little bit about the idea of God's patience and not wanting anyone to perish. We'll talk about that more uh, in a couple weeks. But we kind of see that same thing. And then he goes into the next few verses. Let's go ahead and read uh, verses 4 through 10 and have that on our mind, and we'll talk about that quickly. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them, day after day he was tormenting his righteous soul uh, over the, their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. I have to change my slide. Sorry about that. All right. Verses 4 through 10a. Peter offers four proofs as evidence that they that, that, that judgment is coming. And what are those four proofs? I'll put them on the screen. Angels, Noah, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot. Noah slash flood. Kind of two things in one there, right? Uh, what, are, what, what does each one of these teach us? What do we learn? Why, why four different examples and what's the difference? Judgment. All right. Overall, judgment. Okay, judgment and salvation. I agree with that. What specifically about angels? Why does that come up? What's the, what's the point? Well, they're above us, and Jesus, they're helping us, and they're going to come too. And they're going to count on Jesus, not on you helping them. Absolutely. Angels, if, if it's going to happen to angels, you better believe it's going to happen to these false prophets, right? And how do we know for sure it's going to happen to these angels? What's the imagery? Right, but so, but what, what's, where are they at right now? How? They are in chains right now, right? That's the imagery Peter has given them. Not only are angels above us, but they're going to be held accountable. I mean, he's painting this picture. They are literally in chains right now. They're not escaping this. There's no getting out of this. They are going to be held accountable for that. All right, what about Noah and the flood? What's the, what's the point there, the takeaway? The, what's the big hitter? Mm -hmm. So God loves us, right? God's love. How could God punish his creation? Noah. <laughs> I mean, that's Peter's point, right? Look at Noah. How many people were on the earth when, when the flood came? Any idea? Was it, it was Noah, so there was eight, so there was like, what, 20, 30 people on the earth? Billions, possibly, people, right? This was, this was a global flood. Uh, I read anywhere, one person said there was about a billion people. One person said it might have been as many as three to four billion people. Somebody said the earth was likely as populated in the days of Noah as it was in the days of Christ. I didn't go look up how many were on the earth in the days of Christ. This was a huge event. This, I mean, sometimes maybe it's easy for us to kind of, oh, it was just one country. Or, or, you know, it was, oh, the tsunami came through and took out this little island. Or This was the world. This was a lot of people. Yeah. Adam died not long before Noah was born. 
Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah, they lived longer. They had more kids. I mean, huge amounts of population. We could talk about that all day, too. But the point there is, this was massive. And so anybody that wants to say, well, God loves us. God wouldn't dare hurt his, his creation, the things that he... Baloney, because we have evidence of that already. Also, as, as LR said, there is salvation offered there through Noah, right? What about Sodom and Gomorrah? What's the takeaway from that one? All right. It was, you know, you couldn't even find 10, 10 righteous people there, right? But utter destruction, and not only just destruction, but it was a it was a brutal destruction, right? I mean, fire and brimstone raining down from heaven. I mean, that, that's not a, not that a flood was a pretty picture, but Sodom and Gomorrah, I think, is a little bit more of a bloodbath kind of a picture. And, and it's, it just paints the picture again for us of a very brutal and gruesome judgment on the wicked um, and utter destruction. Um, condemn them to extinction is the imagery there, uh, to ashes. Uh, reduce them to ashes and condemn them to extinction, right? Total and utter destruction and then what what do we learn from lot what's the takeaway there okay so yeah there's applications there so when we read the story of lot in in the old testament we don't really get much idea of the righteous lot that we see here in second peter right um but second peter calls him righteous lot and says that he was he was righteous so uh, I think we have to give him a little bit of credit there, but but we see here that that, that there's deliverance, right? Even in the face of even just like Noah, Noah and Lot are kind of pictures of the same kind of imagery. Uh, two righteous people in the in surrounded by wickedness, right? I mean, Genesis um, six talks about uh, right before the flood that um, in verse five, Genesis six verse five, that you know as you said, God regretted making man, and and that they only thought about evil all the time. Right? That's what Noah lived in. And it sounds like that's what Lot lived in. And so, again, the idea Peter is, is, is bringing here is that God knows how to deliver his people. Even when it's terribly wicked. So no matter what's going on around you, stick to these things that we've told you, that we are eyewitnesses to, that we, we were there for. Don't be turned aside by these false teachers that might promise you something different. And he talks about that later on, that they can't, they can't really give you what they promised anyway. All right, uh, we're going to have to move on because I do. I want to try to finish uh, the last few verses here quickly. So let's let's read the last of the chapter, and then we'll spend the last six minutes or so making some points from the, the end of the chapter. So picking up middle of verse ten, it says, "Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord." But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. From them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For, speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person to that, he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first, for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. All right, beautiful imagery here at the end of Second Peter chapter 2. Uh, let's grab what we can out of this, and then, Joey, if you want to come back and kind of uh, shake this tree a little more, you can. But 
quickly, let's describe these false teachers here in 10b to, to 16. What are some of the, the characteristics or traits that we see here? Okay. Great point. Yeah, if you couldn't hear Lily, she's saying that this this clearly paints a picture that these are the, these are willing offenders, not just misguided. They think they're teaching truth, but they're ap accidentally teaching false. This is bold, brazen, you know, and so that helps her understand the harshness of the punishments that we just talked about in the preceding verses and what's coming up later. So. Yeah, uh, I think her example was we see somebody hurting a kid, our instant instinct is we want them to be hurt or punished for that. Same kind of thing here. Very blatant, uh, very blatant acts here, right? What else? They're brazen, they're bold, they're proud. Deceiving, okay. Amy? Yeah, uh, despising authority, that's one of those, uh, that, that tells you a lot, right? When, 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 when you talk about somebody who despises authority, it tells you a lot about them and you pretty much kind of predict where things are going to go from there, right? What else? Uh, stupid, <laughs> stupid, irrational, I'm sorry, go ahead, what else? Absolutely. They do not care. They, they don't, I mean, to talk about the idea they're not afraid to slander the glorious ones. However, angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a slanderous charge against them before the Lord. I mean, talk about like just laughing in the face of God, basically, is what they're willing to do. Basically, and have no shame in doing it. This is shameless. Yeah, what else? Okay, eyes full of adultery. Now, would the audience of the first century known what Peter was talking about when he talked about false teachers having their eyes full of adultery? Yeah, absolutely. Their whole culture was engulfed in that, right? Um, and I think we see, an, uh, we see a version of that today. Everything is about that, it seems like. Uh, every issue that we deal with seems to come back to sexual temptation or impurity in some way or another. Um, uh, and we see it again, false teachers. I mean, how many of us could name false teachers that that was kind of kind of what did them in? <laughs> um, or, 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 you know, some sort of sexual temptation is what finally took them out of the church for good. Eh? Even ones they were kind of tending that way or whatever. We could all probably make a list. Um, they, it says they are slanderous. I wanted to touch on that for a minute. They, they slander the glorious ones. They do not bring a slant. Or, I'm sorry, that's... Um, the angels don't bring a slanderous charge against them before the Lord. But these people, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, they slander what they do not understand, and in their destruction they too will be destroyed. The idea is that they just they belittle everything. They slander everything. So that's a characteristic that we can look for uh, in this. Um, they never stop looking for sin. They're full of greed. They entice unsteady souls. Um, there's even imagery here of Balaam with his donkey, and they're basically saying that you're just as foolish as Balaam was, who was basically outsmarted by his donkey. So we see that kind of a tongue-in-cheek here thing with Peter and the, the idea of irrational animals. They're saying that, you know, that's kind of what they are like. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, let's see. All right, quickly, waterless springs and uh, mist driven by a storm. What, what's the imagery there? Mm 
Okay, that's, that's exactly it. They're, they're, again, unfulfilled promises or things that they are not capable of giving you. They, they, it looks good, but there, there's no substance to it. Kind of that, the, 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 the mist driven by a storm, that idea of that, that hot summer day, and it looks like it's going to rain, and you think, oh, good, we're going to get a shower, and it's going to cool us off, and then it just it blows away, and you get nothing out of it, right? That, that let down. Same kind, of, same kind of idea here. Um, and there's the bell. All right. If you guys have questions or comments, give them to Joey next week and he'll take all that for me. All right, thanks.